Hi, my name is Janine Bystebos, and in this session, I'm going to be talking about resting state functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, this is going to be an introduction, so I'm mainly going to cover some of the concepts and principles behind resting state fMRI. The first question that we might ask ourselves is why study the brain at rest? Um, so in resting state fMRI, participants are asked to lie in the scanner, but they're not doing any particular cognitive task. They're just asked to lie still, try not to fall asleep. And so why is this of interest? Uh, well, one of the first reasons uh, why we became interested in studying the brain at rest is the energy consumption. So even though the brain is a relatively small um, organ in the body, it consumes a large percentage of the total energy or the total number of calories that we consume. Um, and you can see in the figure here, uh, this is a, an image of oxygen consumption throughout the brain. You can see that the oxygen consumption is not equal throughout the brain. So there are some regions in the brain that consume more oxygen than other regions. Um, and actually, when the brain is engaged in a specific task or a specific cognitive demand, then the percentage increase in terms of the activity is relatively small um, compared to the baseline amount of activity at rest. Uh, and this is one of the really interesting findings uh, in resting state fMRI, uh, which is that there is a number, a set of brain regions uh, shown in the figure at the bottom here, uh, which are now, now collectively known as the default mode network, that show a peculiar activity pattern in which they're actually more active at rest and tend to reduce their activity levels uh, when participants become engaged in, in a particular task, any type of task. So continuing the question of why study the brain at rest, um, one of the key driving factors here is the question of localization versus connectivity. So initially the focus of um, uh, imaging and, and MRI was a question of localization. So mapping which brain regions uh, are related, are performing which type of task. But over the years, there was an increase in interest in connectivity, so communication between different brain regions. And uh, this figure here is from one of the first papers, or the first paper, um, that used resting state uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, showing on the left-hand side, uh, the one the figure labeled with finger tapping shows res a map of activity patterns when subjects um, tapped with both fingers like that. And on the right, um, a comparable resting state image showing connectivity patterns from one of the voxels in this finger tip that, were act that was activated during finger tapping. Um, and what's remarkable here is that you can see that the, the maps are highly similar. And so this points to the fact that we can understand the inherent functional uh, organization of the brain uh, using resting state of MRI because these patterns of organization uh, that are important for to support tasks are maintained at rest. Resting state of MRI has a high potential for be for being used as a clinical or cognitive biomarker. Uh, and I really like this example here. This figure um, showing at the bottom right is showing differences in resting state connectivity between two different groups of subjects, where one of the groups of subjects were um, carriers of a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and the other group of subjects were non-carriers of that risk factor. Um, and that was the only difference here. These are young subjects, there's no difference in cognition, no differences in memory performance, um, and yet this, this genetic, risk vari uh, genetic risk variant can be really sensitively picked up using resting state connectivity. So that shows the potential of using resting state fMRI uh, to address these really important, to make really important clinical uh, cognitive predictions. And then lastly, there are some pragmatic benefits to using resting state fMRI compared with, for example, other setups like um, task fMRI. And that's that it can be done in any population. So there are limited demands on the subjects, um, uh, meaning that you can do it in older people or in children uh, and in people who uh, are relatively sick. Uh, and there's also relatively little setup and expertise required for the experimenter, uh, meaning that this could potentially be done in a hospital setting uh, by uh, nurses or doctors. There are a really large number of different analysis approaches that have been developed 
uh, to analyze resting state fMRI data. And that can be a little bit confusing, um, but it's useful to realize that they all have one assumption in common, and that is that if two brain regions show similarities in their ball time series, then they are functionally connected. And therefore, the definition of functional connectivity is really a statistical concept. It's a statistical dependency or relationship uh, between the measured time series of separate regions. Um, and the differences in terms of all of the different methods that have been uh, developed for analysis of resting state of MRI data lie in the way that these uh, similarities are estimated or represented. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so before we move on, I want to just highlight that there are a number of different types of connectivity. Uh, so what I've been talking about mostly here is functional connectivity, uh, which is the idea of statistical dependencies between time series. So take a time series from one region and a time series from another region and see how similar they are, have some measure of um, uh, to compare the similarity. Another uh, aspect of connectivity that you might come across is dynamic connectivity or time varying connectivity. It's a similar concept to functional connectivity, but now um, the idea is to look at multiple at fluctuations in connectivity over time. So, for example, in the figure here, you can see that separate parts of the time series are considered uh, to look at changes in, con in functional connectivity. Uh, another form of connectivity is effective connectivity, and this asks the question of um, directionality. So is it the case that um, one region influences or drives the other region, or is the, the, the directionality the other way around? And then the last uh, form of connectivity that I want to just briefly mention is anatomical or structural, structural connectivity. So that's uh, the presence of a white matter tract as measured, for example, with diffusion weighted imaging. So in this next section, I'm going to highlight a few different features uh, of resting state fMRI data. Uh, and the first uh, feature is that networks that we find in the data are very replicable. Um, so this study, this figure here, is showing um, the percent variance that you might see um, when you perform the same type of analysis, same type of resting state uh, fMRI analysis, on multiple different data sets. And you can see that all of these, uh, at least at their center, at their core, all of these different networks um, are found very robustly and reproducibly. Uh, this slide is showing the, the, the real focal localization of resting state networks in the gray matter. Uh, these, are, these are results from uh, high resolution unsmoothed images, so they might look a little noisy at first when you look at them. But when you zoom in, as you can see on the bottom line here, you can really see that these resting state, the outline of these resting state networks follows the gray matter ribbon uh, very nicely. Uh, another key uh, feature of resting state is the relationship to task. I hinted uh, towards this a little bit already talking about the baseball study, uh, but this principle has been extended. So, for example, the study on the bottom left here shows um, similarity between resting state networks and task activation networks um, across the brain, so for many different regions of the brain. So this figure at the right here actually uh, tries to use at an individual subject level to use resting state uh, spatial maps to try and predict task activation maps uh, within an individual. And you can see that it does a really good job at that. Uh, another important factor is the relationship between functional and structural connectivity. So there have been a number of different studies comparing um, uh, diffusion weighting, uh, tractography results with resting state fMRI results, and there's a relatively good uh, relationship between these, uh, although there are also, uh, it is possible to find functional connectivity when there is no direct structural connection or structural white matter pathway uh, between two regions. That's when you can have indirect pathways. So, for example, um, region one might be connected to region uh, three, even though there's not, not one direct white matter path between those two regions, but there's a white matter path that goes through another region. And so that explains some of the differences between functional and structural connectivity. Um, but overall, there is a reasonably good relationship between these two types of connectivity. Um, 
And one of the other things that I want to touch on is that you might have heard um, resting state, functional uh, MRI or, or connectivity being described as low frequency fluctuations. Um, and the origin of this is essentially that um, the bold signal, whether it's resting state fMRI or task-based fMRI, uh, has the majority of its power in the low frequency range, meaning that uh, the signal tends to vary kind of smoothly and slowly over time rather than having sudden spikes. Um, and this is because what we're measuring is not um, individual neurons or action potentials or anything like that. What we're measuring are uh, hemodynamic changes in the blood flow, and those tend to uh, uh, develop slowly over time. And that's why uh, one of the suggestions, one of the early suggestions um, for cleaning up or uh, pre-processing the bold signal is to remove all of the higher frequencies and focus only on the lower frequencies. Because as you can see on the right here, the higher frequencies do tend to have a higher contribution uh, of some of these artifactual uh, uh, signals. However, um, when you look at this more closely, it is certainly true that the power of the bold signal decreases, so it's strongest in the, in the lowest frequencies and then decreases in the higher frequencies. However, the, the degrees of freedom, the temporal degrees of freedom, increase from lower frequencies to higher frequencies. And that just means that um, if you see, if you know the signal at one time point, how many time points ahead will you still be able to make a, a useful prediction? And that number of time points that you'll be able to make a prediction reduces at higher frequencies because the signal fluctuates more quickly. Uh, and so the, the, the time points become more independent of each other than at lower frequencies. And if you combine that information, then you find that actually the signal contains information about resting state networks or uh, functional connectivity, uh, both in the lower frequency range, but also at higher frequencies. And this has actually been shown. People have uh, uh, removed some of the bold signal in the low frequencies and run the same analyses and been able to find the same resting state networks at higher frequencies. Um, so describing connectivity as low frequency fluctuations is perhaps a little bit of a misnomer knowing this, this relationship. Um, the last thing, I'm not going to talk about this too much, um, but there is um, some really nice work from different groups um, studying the relationship between electrophysiological recordings uh, of neural activity and bold um, measures of uh, connectivity in particular uh, using MEG, EEG um, and ECOG. And, and if you're interested in learning more about that, then I'd encourage you to look at some of these uh, references that I've included here. So what I'd like to finish on in this session is to provide a little bit of an overview of the different analyses that have been developed uh, for resting state fMRI. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of different analysis methods have been developed. Uh, and that can be a little bit confusing when you're first um, uh, starting in this new area of research. And what I find helpful is to think, is to categorize um, methods in terms of whether they're voxel-based methods or node-based methods. Um, and what I mean with that is voxel-based methods um, estimate, uh, the result of a voxel-based method is a map, brain map. So voxel-based methods estimate some value or multiple values for every spatial location in the brain, for every voxel or vertex if you're working on the surface. Um, and that estimate can be many different things, so you can still have a wide variety of different voxel-based methods, but the outcome is a map. For node-based methods, the first step of node-based methods is to summarize the whole brain as a set of nodes or brain regions. Um, here you can see an example of three nodes, so the gray, the blue, and the red. Um, usually it's many more than that, or covering potentially the entire brain, so uh, dozens or uh, several hundred nodes are pretty common. Um, but the result of a node-based method is no longer a map, because we no longer have one estimate per spatial location, per voxel or vertex. Um, and so that's the difference between these two categories. In this next slide, uh, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the methods that are available to analyze resting state of MRI data, um, but these are some of the ones that are quite commonly used, and I've, I've grouped them into voxel-based methods on the right, on the left, and node-based methods uh, on the right. And in some of the other sessions uh, included uh, in the course, 
uh, we will cover uh, these two in particular uh, and some of the other ones in less detail, but in particular independent component analysis or ICA uh, and network modeling analysis or uh, FSL nets. And with that, I will finish off uh, pointing you to some resources. Um, so uh, definitely check out the FSL mailing list is a great place to ask your questions. Um, there's a book available uh, that um, talks about a lot of these topics, particularly in resting state of MRI that you might find interesting. And also just to note that all of the references at the bottom of the slides uh, contain links that you can click on that bring you to the paper. Um, thank you very much for listening.